This is a Psychology Today cassette, one in a series of interviews and special presentations featuring contemporary clinicians, researchers, and educators discussing their work in the behavioral and social sciences. Today, correspondent Rosemary Jennings talks to B.F. Skinner, the father of behaviorism, and one of this country's most distinguished psychologists. The Harvard professor and researcher reveals in this interview and in his autobiography, Particulars of My Life, details of his childhood and early adulthood that helped shape his personality and set the stage for his later achievements. Rosemary Jennings begins the conversation. Dr. Skinner, could you tell us how you decided to write your autobiography? Well, I had several reasons. I was not pleased with what critics have had to say about my work in many cases, and it often seemed to be based upon a misunderstanding of me as a person, my intentions, and so on. And I thought the first thing to do would be to simply put down, as honestly as I could, what my life has been like and correct the record. I don't trust others to do a thing like this, so I thought I'd better do it before I miss the chance. But I also wanted to have on record as much as I could remember the relevant facts about my life so that I could study myself simply as a behaving individual. After all, I'm a behaviorist. I've studied the behavior of organisms. I'm an organism. And when I have finished putting down the record of what actually happened, I intend to analyze it from a behavioristic point of view. I'm not at the moment analyzing it as I go, however. I'm just trying to record what happened well, more or less in the way in which one writes a novel. I'm not inventing anything, but I'm simply telling things in a serial order as a life unfolds. Yes, my feeling as I read it was it had almost a Tolstoy quality in terms of describing a period and capturing incidents with incredible detail without really saying too much about how you felt about how things went on. Yes, I think how I felt about it all would be irrelevant. Of course, there are those who would say quite the contrary, how I felt is the only important thing. But I don't feel that. I think there are many moving scenes in the book, very strongly emotional episodes, but I don't say that I wept or that I wrung my hands in anguish or anything of that sort. I leave it up to the reader to suppose that, as a sensitive person, I felt the death of my brother. I was very much touched by my interview with my school teacher who was dying. These things, I did, of course, respond to them. In telling the story as it happened, I simply say what, I, what went on. Yes, yes. What kinds of things do you feel like might be cleared up in terms of what critics have said about you? What do you think maybe you've been able to communicate in the autobiography that will at least put a different stamp on that? Uh, I think mainly my motives, what I'm planning to do with the world. I've been characterized in the most extreme fashion as someone who was manipulating people as a marionette operator manipulates a marionette, and I've never done anything like that, really. My personal relations with my family and my friends do not, I think, represent some kind of Machiavellian manipulation. I see no sign in myself of any aspiration to run the world, but I think it's possible that my scientific work could be used and misused, of course, but I hope it will not be misused by me, at least. And I think the only way to assure the reader is to give some indication of why one has lived and why one does what one does. I found your book so rich with little details that really captured the way you were feeling in a lot of situations from your camp letters, which were very, very funny. <laughs> yes, they were. <laughs> and it was wonderful the way you captured so much, and I was going to ask you how you remember so much. Obviously, it did come from the composite. It came from the evidence, for example. Those letters that my brother and I wrote from camp, they were terribly funny. We were obviously <laughs> having a miserable time, and we were homesick, and we didn't want to say so. No, I wouldn't have remembered anything of that. Even I then, was... you were capable of describing things in incredible detail, like that camp letter. Well, yes, and I like to use the material itself. I have used some clippings. I've used letters. One or two critics have rather thought I went in for that too much, but in a quite literal sense, this is a documentary. As I am using documents, yes, because they have a certain quality. The, the misspellings in the letters from camp are an indication of how our schooling had been effective or ineffective at that age and so on. These are relevant details that are in the evidence that one would probably not put in by recall if one were simply writing from memory. Right. Related to that, finding out that you probably experienced it differently at the time than you remembered it in the present, did you find the whole thing a learning process to do the autobiography? 
Yes, well, I've never been psychoanalyzed, but I suspect that I went through something very much like that. Once you put down some detail, they remind you of others, and things flash. And I would carry a notebook around with me, and by my bed I have a tape recorder, and I would simply say, auto, and then I would put down uh, on the tape recorder at night some little thing I thought of. Oh. And they would build up, and one suggests another, and in a way, it is a, I wouldn't say learning so much as a search a search for what is there and all the incidental prompts and probes you can cook up or work to bring out more. One recollection acts as a probe for another. Mm -hmm. Did you find then that you look back on your past differently from being immersed in the process of writing about it? Well, undoubtedly, what you arrive at in the end is very different from your first recollections. There was a period in that covered in my book, the year after college, when I made a mistake. I convinced myself that I wanted to be a writer, and I persuaded my family to let me just stay home and write. Well, it was a horrible situation, and I had nothing to say, and I produced nothing, and I was miserable. Now that, as I developed it, and as I recovered the notes I'd written at the time, the letters that I wrote to people and so on, that turns into something very different from my first recollection, which was it was just a blank. What I recall in my life at that time it was a blank. Hmm. That's interesting. It was as if you really, that was unpleasant, and you just canceled it from your memory. Yes, and I don't suppose it was entirely because it was unpleasant. It was that, of course. Same thing was true of college. I didn't know how I would develop the college phase in my autobiography, but once I went back and read my themes that I had written and then remembered the professors and things that happened, and with a little correspondence with a few friends and so on, more, more and more came back, and it builds up into a fairly important part of the story, as it wasn't a part of my life. It was a very important life, college, four college years. Yes, yes. Would you think that anybody who read your autobiography, just picked it up, do you think they would get some sense of your work in psychology from looking at it, or do you think... It isn't too revealing about what your theories are about behavior and your later work. I think one might conclude that the person who wrote this story, if my name were not on it, if someone read the thing blind, someone would say the person who wrote this story was interested in behavior rather than in soul-searching and the struggle of a personality to find itself and all that kind of thing. That's not what it's about. It's about what actually happened. Describing what happened the, the, rather than... There's a bit of anthropology there in the description of a small community. Definitely, yes. And some history, the things that happened at the time, the World War and all of that. And, of course, what happened to me personally, as one might write it in a novel. This is a description of behavior simply as one narrates a series of events. And... You would conclude, I suppose, that such a person was not a Freudian or perhaps even a humanistic type of psychologist who feels that discovering the self is the important thing in life. I would guess that maybe more is revealed about your later work by the style in the way that you've described rather than any content instead of presenting material or content. Yes, I don't think you could find episodes that foreshadowed my intellectual interest later on. There is that curious little thing that I did see a set of performing pigeons at the state fair. Well, later on, of course, I was specializing in performing pigeons. Yes. <laughs> but I doubt very much whether, in fact, I'm quite sure, I didn't turn to pigeons because of that. I turned to them for a quite irrelevant reason, which will turn up in the second volume. Could you tell us a little bit about your childhood? And let's go right into the autobiography a little bit and talk about what your family was like and what your town was like. You've done such a marvelous job of describing it. For me, it really conveyed a whole period, and I really had a feeling of what your childhood was like. Can you describe it a little bit for us now? Well, I grew up in a small town. There was, oh, three or 4,000, perhaps 5,000 for the community. There were two little towns nearby. A little town across the river went about a mile away. Altogether, about 5,000 people. That was very small, of course. You knew them all, by sight at least. And I went to a school, a woman building, for 12 years. My graduating class had six or seven people in it. We had attention, personal attention. We knew our teachers well. They knew our families. The whole community was pretty tightly integrated. All four of my grandparents lived within walking distance, so that I could drop in on them whenever I felt like it. They were not interesting people in general. My grandfather Skinner was a failed house painter, I suppose you'd say. He never really worked much. My grandmother Skinner must have had a very low IQ, I think. She was very stupid. 
But she had aspirations which drove my father on. He became a lawyer, self-educated, self-made, became quite well known. He wrote what a distinguished book on compensation law before he died. My mother's family, my father, my grandfather, was a carpenter, head of a carpenter shop. And his wife, my grandmother, came from a rather old American family, but no ambitions, no aspirations at all. My mother was talented. She sang a beautiful voice, played the piano, continued to play until her death. She used to sit down at the piano and play, as I cannot play by memory. She dominated the family, I think. As one person in the town put it, my mother made quite a man of my father, <laughs> and I think that she was aware of that. I had a younger brother who died quite young. When you were in we college, We got along actually. together, as far as I know, very well. I don't believe there was any sibling rivalry. That I never felt any of the sort. Were you particularly close to any one member of the family? No, I think I spent more time and hours with my grandmother Burris, I think my mother's mother. Mm -hmm. I used to drop in and play cards with her, or dominoes, or something of that kind. She controlled me in subtle ways. She was a very good cook, always had pie. and <laughs> Positive uh, reinforcement. That there. sort of thing around. And once when I had quarreled with her, I walked by the house and saw her behind the screen door. She was holding up a lump of maple sugar. Ah. She knew how to get me to come back to see her. <laughs> but it was not a distinguished childhood. My father felt I should work, and I had a job. I worked in a shoe store. I worked for the newspaper. I cribbed news out of the paper that came in from Binghamton, New York, every morning. I cribbed it for our little local paper. And I would once in a while write an article, some feature article about... Something that happened in the old days because the newspaper had a lot of old copies around and I would search in them for something or other. I had very little musical education. I did take a year of the piano from an old man who sucked sen sens and jabbed me in the ribs with his pencil when I made a mistake. <laughs> I heard one symphony program during those years. That was in Binghamton, New York, and it was the only time that Boston Symphony ever went to Binghamton. And my newspaper gave me free tickets because they had run an ad for them, I suppose. I did hear quite a lot of phonograph records, operas and things of that sort, mm -hmm. but uh, very, very poor musical or artistic background, of course. Did you do whatever you did in these ways with your family, or was it something that you sort of did on your own? Your mother was interested in music, so that must have been part of it. Well, no, I once played a saxophone. I played a saxophone, and my mother would accompany me, but I couldn't stand it because she never would accompany me. She would play on, waiting for me to follow, and I kept saying, look, I'm playing this solo. You should follow me, but she never could. A contest of wills, maybe, there, uh, huh? Well, I don't know what it was, but her job was to sit down there and play the accompaniment, and I was to follow. <laughs> no, I never was close to my parents or my brother passed the early stages when we were very small children. You and your brother were close when you were very small, right? Uh, yes, my brother was younger than I. He was more athletic than I. He was good at sports, and I was not. Now, I was to some extent a loner, I suppose. I did things that my parents didn't understand. My interests would puzzle them. What would be some of those? For example, at one point I became interested in the Baconian theory of the authorship of Shakespeare and spent a lot of time reading the works of Francis Bacon. Yes which no one had any interest at the time. Did people think you were peculiar for being interested in that? No, I don't think so. There was a little library there, and I used to explore, dig up what I could find in the library. I don't think anybody thought I was peculiar. It just wasn't a all. shared interest. No. Yeah. After all, my father was one of the more successful people in the little town, and I was his son. I suppose that was how they sized me up, Will Skinner's son, Frederick. Yes. So you really didn't like sports that much. You really had more of an interest in books and... Yeah, I never was any good. We used to play three or cat in the backyard. It's an informal game, you know, you toss up, get sides. But I never played baseball well. We had no football. We'd play in races and that kind of thing. I could run pretty fast, but uh, I wasn't a competing sportsman at all. Yes, yes. I get the sense from the way you describe your family in your book and also a bit in our conversation together that... There wasn't anyone that you were particularly close to, but there also wasn't that much dissension. There wasn't anybody with whom you had no, a lot of difficulty. No, very little quarreling, very little quarreling of any kind. There was a teacher, Miss Graves, Mary Graves, who uh, just an old maid school teacher, thought she was. But she was terribly important in my life. I dedicated a book to her, actually. And she died my senior year in high school of tuberculosis, which she no doubt had for many, many years, and she wouldn't be allowed to teach today. But she came from a very unusual family that was interested in literature and way beyond the level of the town. 
And she got me interested in unusual books and unusual art and so on. She was undoubtedly an important influence in my life, but I wasn't close to her. I did go to call on her that evening when she was dying. It was a very moving experience. But I would have taken the side of the boys in general who thought that she was a rather tough old maid school teacher. The tougher boys in the class didn't respond to her virtues at all, and she would have to call in the principal every now and then and discipline them, that kind of thing. And I would probably have been disloyal enough to have sided with them at times when I was not with her. I don't think I would have defended her or stood up for her. It wasn't that close a relationship. And yet she really did have an influence over you. You can feel oh, it very, in the book, very, too. Very yes. great influence. Yes. She was really an intellectual stimulus, and apparently she, you'd visit her on Sundays. And mm. She was the intellectual leader of the town, although she was not a dynamic person at all. She didn't lead, but she at least represented what there was by way of good literature. She did something with the library. She used to read to us Saturday mornings in the library from Uncle Remus or Kipling, something of that kind. If you were to look back and think of some of the people who really made that contribution to your life, they in some way reinforced you or shaped your behavior, she might be one. Are there other people who similarly had a big impact on you? Well, I can't think of any particular one. There was a Professor Bowles who taught mathematics, and he taught very well, and I always enjoyed mathematics. I'm never afraid of math, as many people were. And I had a very close friend, Raphael Miller, who yes. was uh, my own age. And I continued to see him and when I came on to graduate school for just a year before he died in a tragic accident. He was something of a moral model. I always thought of him as the completely virtuous man, mm. although I don't think I actually imitated him in that respect. Was your friendship based on similar interests outside of school or school interests? Yes, or? we did things together. We'd enter into commercial enterprises once we went in for gathering elderberries and selling them door to door and that oh. kind of thing. <laughs> I'd be curious to know if there were points in your childhood that you remember as really critical in terms of some kind of decision you had to make, a moral decision or some junctures, and what happened in those circumstances for you? I think the curious thing is that I didn't make decisions. They always were made for me somehow or other. I would come to an impasse of some kind and then struggle a bit and then something would turn up. The big example of that was when I was wasting that awful year in Scranton, Pennsylvania, where my family had moved. When you wanted to be a I writer. I wanted to be a writer, and yes. I was sitting around and doing nothing. And I finally decided just to get out, get some exercise, so I hired myself out to a landscape gardener and started rolling lawns and that kind of thing. I don't know what I would have done then if my father had not come home and suggested that I take on a job that someone might have done. It was a kind of writing. In 1904, there had been a very violent, vicious strike in the anthracite coal industry, and President Roosevelt had appointed a commission, and they had arranged for grievances to be adjudicated and settled by the Board of Conciliation. And over the years, there have been cases decided uh, were important as precedents in further cases. And the big coal companies wanted someone to go through and write a digest of these decisions so that their lawyers could very quickly get the relevant information about earlier decisions. So I became a lawyer for them, essentially. read thousands of decisions and abstracted them and classified them and wrote something called a digest of decisions of the Anthracite Board of Conciliation. Well, it's something just happened to be thrown at me, uh, something I could do, and I made some money, and the money... You didn't have to respond, however. You could have stayed with your misery in the writing that wasn't happening. Well, I was very glad to escape from trying to write something creatively, but with the money which this brought, and it was quite a good deal because the coal companies were willing to pay a lot to get this done, I then began to think about going on to graduate work. Mm. Well, now, there was a decision that what was I to do? The first thing that occurred to my company was I'd go back to Hamilton College and take an M.A. in English. That's what I've been my major. This was that old problem. The young fledgling doesn't want to leave the nest. I knew Hamilton College. I knew the professors. But then something else turned up. Again, I didn't make a decision. I just happened, as a person in the field of literature, I had subscribed to The Dial. The Dial was an old magazine, a distinguished magazine, probably the most distinguished magazine ever published in America. Every issue had a tipped-in... Impressionist painting, beautiful things. And there were very good articles. And some of them by Bertrand Russell called my attention to John B. Watson and behaviorism. So I bought Watson's book and got interested in that. And 
Then for almost no reason at all, I decided I would go to graduate school, but I wouldn't go into English. I'd go into psychology. Well, I knew no psychology at all. I never had a course in psychology. I didn't know what it was about. I thought it was about behaviorism. And my biology teacher had shown me Pavlov's book on conditioned reflexes. So in the strength of that, I applied to Harvard and was admitted. I wouldn't be admitted today. I don't have the qualifications for a graduate student today. I had very little science except for biology and a great deal of English and Romance languages in my undergraduate record. This completes the first part of our discussion. We continue on side two. We now continue our discussion with Professor B.F. Skinner. That decision was hardly made by me. It was just a whim, the way things happened to turn. And again and again, as I have found my life, it is the effect of random choices. When you came to times when your life took some kind of shift, do you remember people who gave you encouragement? Were there people you could go to during difficult periods? Even no, I back? don't think so. Looking back on my whole life, I think it's quite clear that I have never been very much influenced by what other people said about me or what they did with respect to what I've done. That's hard to be sure about that. One of my friends who subscribes to a different philosophy said that I'm extremely inner-directed, but that isn't an explanation either. I think in the very beginning, I have been very much reinforced, as I would put it. My behavior has been reinforced by its effects. As a child, I built things, and there they were after I built them. I played the saxophone, and music came out. And I did some drawing and painting and so on, and there I had something to show for it. I invented things, and sometimes they worked. And when I got into psychology, I began to do experiments, and the organism would behave. And it was rats and pigeons that reinforced my behavior as a psychologist, not what people have said about my publications. And the only nice thing about that is that one doesn't mind very much when the verbal consequences of what other people say is not reinforcing. I don't think I'm thick-skinned. I don't think I'm insensitive to criticism, but I'm not seriously bothered by it. Just yesterday, I read a very long analysis of my supposed theories of psychic events, and it couldn't have been a more complete misunderstanding of my views. But I didn't get upset about this, because I'm satisfied that my experiments work, and I get the results I say I get. And as to theory, I'm satisfied with certain simplifying achievements. I think there are ways of saying things which are more effective than others. And I've had, I think, reasonable luck in finding effective ways of talking about behavior, as well as effective ways of doing things about it. Now, that's not the whole story. I don't claim to have got the whole story, but what I have done reinforces my behavior as a scientist and as a philosopher of science, and that is much more important to me than someone writing a review and saying this is great. In that, though, you must have found some ways of coping with your own frustrations when things didn't work. Can you say something about that? You didn't go to other people for encouragement, perhaps, but how did you handle that? Did you drop the things that weren't working, or even back when you were little and you were doing... Well, one of the things about responding for reasonable consequences and quick consequences, you do stop when things don't go right. You build something, and if it falls down, you start to build something else. And you learn to put up with lacks of success without being unduly frustrated and punished by it. Did you see that around you in anybody else's behavior where you might have imitated some of that behavior? I find it very hard to spot anyone whose behavior I emulated. As a person, I would not like my father. I admired Raphael Miller, my close friend, but I wasn't very much like him. I would not like Miss Graves. I was certainly not like my teachers, especially my psychological teachers. I argued with them. I do not see that I ever took anyone as a model. I would be curious then to hear what you think about how you were able to be this confident in the face of frustration, mm -hmm. and what do you think maybe in your childhood contributed to that? Well, I think you're right in asking it what in my childhood contributed to it. I was afraid you were going to say what characteristic of your personality or something like that, which I don't believe in. I think that I was lucky, again, 
in having been on a certain schedule of successes as a child. Not everything I did paid off, but often enough. And you build up a tendency to continue to behave when there is a reasonable chance of another success. And as the interval between successes increases, you get hooked the way a gambler gets hooked by decreasing odds. And I think that by the time I became a psychologist, I had been on what I would call a stretched variable ratio schedule, which enabled me to carry on for a great many years without any recognition. I didn't need the recognition because my rats were reinforcing me. By the time I published The Behavior of Organisms, there were at most half a dozen people who understood my procedures or knew anything about them or could use them. For the next 10 years or so, I got very little recognition, and yet I was absolutely sure I was right, and I went right on doing the same kind of thing. I remember those years as being unsupported by recognition, but it is still true that in, I think it was in 1944, I was given the Howard Crosby Warren Medal by this little society of experimental psychologists, so that I probably had a somewhat greater national reputation, and it seemed to me at the time I was off in Minnesota doing war work, out of contact with all my old friends and so on in the, in the East. And I did feel isolated, and I did feel that no one really knew what I was doing except for a few people locally and one or two friends, such as Fred Keller, with whom I was in close contact by letters. But I probably was wrong. Nevertheless, I was not aware of much of this. And I went right on holding the same role, even though I was not getting paid off in terms of recognition on any reasonable schedule. The only explanation I have is that my rats were paying me off. Mm -hmm. I was getting positive results. That's where your reinforcement was. Yes. Right. They get the credit. Right. This would lead me to think that there was considerable experience in your childhood that really strengthened you and gave you qualities that you could endure through difficult periods. In your recent article that has a similar title with a slight twist to your book Beyond Freedom and Dignity, your article Between Freedom and Despotism, you say, and I quote you here, positively reinforced behavior is active participation in life, free of boredom and depression. When our behavior is positively reinforced, we say we enjoy what we are doing. We call ourselves happy. Would you describe your childhood as being happy? I remember it as happy, as I say. Things I wrote at the time occasionally refer to conflicts, puzzlement, and a sense of loneliness. I don't remember that. I did a great many things. When I think of some of the people who come to us as graduate students today who've grown up in an apartment in New York City, for example, they never had a chance to dig holes in the ground, to build houses, to go hunting. I didn't hunt with guns. I hunted most with a mousetrap designed to catch chipmunks alive, that sort of thing, to build a shack along a creek somewhere, to build the old swimming pool in which I learned to swim by damming up a little stream and that kind of thing. And I played instruments, I played in a band and wrote for a newspaper and sold shoes in a shoe store. If you just list the kinds of things I did, there's an enormous variety there compared with most lives today which have been frozen and rather narrow. Also, it was in a small town so that you really, as you say, you knew people. There was tremendous interaction. I knew a great variety of people and most of them on friendly terms. There were dissensions, there were class lines, religious lines that I found very difficult to cross. I fell in love with a Catholic girl, but why? This wasn't right. It wasn't right for her family, it wasn't right for my family, and I quickly abandoned the whole venture. Those things were too strong in those days to break down. But even so, I fell in love many times and had many rather relatively innocent consequences of that. Getting back a minute to your statement about your definition, really, of what positive reinforced behavior is. You say it's free of boredom and depression. Do you find that your childhood and, and your later life, I should note here for our listeners that the autobiography, your first volume, goes until you were just out of college. I have never had any deep depression of any kind, and I don't have anxieties except for trivial things. How about boredom? Very seldom, very, very seldom bored. And then only when I have been forced into a situation where I can't do what I want to do. I suffered the sheer essence of boredom in A Course Professor Boring. 
on perception. This was one of his systematic courses, and it's nothing I cared at all about, but I had to take it. And I used to sit and write notes and listen to the bell in the Catholic Church strike the quarter hours, and that was absolute agony, the boredom there. You would say then that your behavior was positively reinforced by the products of what you were doing, whether it was yes. musical or whether you were doing something to do with you were writing something, you produced a poem, rather than what would come out of interaction with people. Yes, certainly so. You asked about important figures in my life. I suppose one was Robert Frost. I met him one summer between my junior and senior years at Bredlow, Vermont. And he showed some interest in me and asked me to send him some of my stuff. And that fall, I sent him three short, short stories. And the following April, a letter which is printed in his yes. collected letters, it's very, very favorable. Well, of course, that's very reinforcing in its personal reinforcement, commendation from a very much admired figure. And it probably figured in my decision to go into literature and to try myself as a writer for a year. Whether it was a bad decision, I don't know. I don't really know whether these things work in the long run against you or not. But I don't think it was very important as a reinforcer because actually I didn't go on writing. And if it should have reinforced me for much of anything, it should have been for writing short, short stories. And I don't think I ever finished another one after that. Mm. Uh, during that year, I tried and fiddled around with things. But I don't believe that that letter, although it's something I value, had any great effect on me as a writer or as a person. However, you have been very prolific in your writings, even though it wasn't on the same course that you thought it would be. Yes, but by the time I decided to come to Harvard and go into psychology, I turned bitterly against literature. I used to write polemics against literature. Why, it was, why all, was that? Why it did was you turn against it? all fraud, and that science was the only way to understand human behavior, and that literary people could portray people and personalities and episodes because they were people and were putting down what they had to say and describe what they did, but that this was not an analysis, was not science. I was very much helped there by a quotation from G.K. Chesterton, a friend of mine who later became a nun, once quoted to me. Chesterton was talking about a character in Thackeray, and he'd been discussing this with a woman, and the woman leaned over and in a harsh voice said to Chesterton, she drank. Thackeray didn't know it, but she drank. <laughs> well, that was the cue. Thackeray didn't know it. He was portraying an alcoholic woman, but didn't know what made her the way she was. But this woman, who knew an alcoholic woman, spotted mm -hmm. the real cause of the behavior. Well, I wanted to be a scientist. I didn't want to be able to cook up portraits of alcoholic women because I had had contact with one or myself an alcoholic or something like that. I wanted to be able to analyze behavior and attribute it to the real causes as they would be discovered by a scientist. One of the key concepts I find in your work has to do with the really uselessness of punishment. And I'm curious to know if that was an experience in your childhood that you were punished for your behavior or your parents didn't use punishment and you appreciated that? It's hard to say whether I was punished or not. Physically, the only punishment I ever remember was my mother heard me use a bad word, took me to the bathroom, rang out our washcloth and soap and water, and washed my mouth out. This is a ritual, something like baptism, washing away. It's a curious metaphor kind yes, of thing, really. But I never was paddled or anything of that sort. However, I had very strong reaction to my father's disapproval and my mother's disapproval. She had me to say, uh, tut, tut, and I knew that I had done something wrong. She often said, what will people think? Ah. And my father went out of his way to demonstrate, to take me through a jail to show where people went who disobeyed the law. And they once took me to a slide lecture on life in Sing Sing. <laughs> well, I don't know whether this was really to change me or whether it happened to be the only lecture that was available at that time. We were on a vacation somewhere or not. But they were sticklers for behaving correctly. And they didn't need the physical punishment. But was I then punished? Well, yes, I think I was in the sense that there were a great many things if I did them, I would immediately be censured. And the censure was probably more important to me than a paddling in the woodshed for a person who didn't much mind paddling, rather like to make his father mad or something of that sort. <laughs> so I think I was probably punished. In fact, I'm quite sure that my life has always been, to some extent, under aversive control. But I do things to avoid consequences in addition to achieving them.
Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that you say your mother used the social effect, what you would look like, mm -hmm. social acceptability as a mode of punishment, and yet you said earlier that it's been one of the things that you haven't paid too much attention to, people's critical response to you. Well, of course, she was always thinking about the negative things they would think, that I'd been bad, I'd done the wrong thing, made a mistake. The things that others did that she laughed at, a combination of necktie and mm -hmm. shirt that didn't match, that was just funny to other people, but it was a crime if I came downstairs with the wrong tie on. Frederick, <laughs> you can't wear that tie with that shirt, so I wouldn't. But that was the extent of it. It was on the punitive side. Now, that's very different from my coming down and having her say, that looks awfully nice. I don't remember she ever said that. As a hmm. matter of fact, later on when I was at Harvard and would write home about what I was doing, I don't think I ever wrote back and said, good for you. They would hmm. say, what the effect has this? What does this mean for society or something of that kind? I don't remember ever being praised, except in mild ways. Just, yes, that was a good job by my family. You see, if you control aversively as they did, you can't give away your power by praising. This is the awful thing. When you get mad at someone, you don't want to be the one who makes up because the power of being angry has to be abandoned when you then turn out to be nice. And I think a person who is controlling others punitively feels he's losing all his power by praising. I've done things that my family was proud of. My father was inordinately proud of me, and so much so that I had to make sure he wouldn't run to newspapers with some, and I published a paper or something like that. Do you see any connection between your own interest in positive reinforcement with the fact that your parents didn't positively reinforce you that much? I don't know. I think probably my search for alternatives to punishment have been due to that, and I've had my own children, for example. I say, you haven't written this week, and where's your letter? And so and they would send postcards addressed with items for me to check. I'm alive and so on, that <laughs> kind of thing. But I never have asked my children to write, never. I love to get letters from them, but it would never occur to me to say, you haven't written, or please write. Uh -huh. I don't want to put that kind of pressure on them. My daughter just uh, sent a check to Internal Revenue, and it bounced, and it came to our address here, and I had to open it and send up my own check to cover before there were more penalties. And I sent it on to her, and I said, you owe me so much money, but I didn't say, why don't you be more careful about this, uh -huh. or made a mistake. I wouldn't think of that. And I think that's because I had a lot of that myself. And Were you able to be non-punitive with your two daughters when they were small also? Yes, we tried very hard. We didn't with our own daughter for a while, and then she got into that position of just asking for punishment by reaching for things she was supposed to touch. So my wife and I just agreed we would never punish her again. How did you and handle it when she did something like that? Well, afterwards, he'd reach and look at us and see what was going on, and we never did, and it never made a bit of difference, as far as I can see. Both my daughters are highly moral and well-behaved and successful people without punishment. What are some other ways that your own childhood experiences and the way your parents brought you up in some way relate, either by doing the opposite or imitating the way your parents were with you to the way you brought up your kids? I don't know. I suppose we all treat our children as we were treated to some extent. We learn by what has been done to us. But as I say, and I have realized this more as I've been writing the autobiography, I am rather critical now of my parents. I think the portrait I draw of them has been regarded, especially by their surviving friends, as rather harsh. In fact, one of my friends said, I think your father comes off very much better than you think. I mean, he's a much nicer person than you give him credit for being. But I've certainly tried very hard not to manipulate my children. I've never practiced behavior modification, but I have certainly tried to arrange a world for them in which their behavior would be positively reinforced and a world in which they would not be severely punished. It sounds like you're making a distinction between behavior modification and arranging the world so that they will be positively reinforced. Well, it's all part of a behavioral technology, but by behavior modification, when I used the word at that moment, I meant the actual contriving of reinforcers, making them contingent on desired behavior. But I think it's much better if you can do it by arranging situations in which the reinforcers naturally follow from the behavior, both socially and physically. Mm -hmm. As if you want a child to develop as an artist, you could stand around and give the child M&Ms whenever he draws a line or something like that, but it's much more effective to provide, let us say, marking pens and so on and make magnificent lines when you mark on and give them big sheets of paper where they can do big things and that kind of thing. The material itself does all the reinforcing in that case. 
It sounds as if some of your early observations about positive reinforcement and punishment really came from looking at the way you were brought up. Is that true, or do you feel like it came out of your experiences later on in graduate school in psychology? I've no doubt have been sensitive to the things that I have discovered in my experiments, possibly because they would bear on what has happened to me in the past. The strengthening of behavior under positive reinforcement is a very important thing. It's a thing that people forget. It builds a tendency to behave in an open, relaxed way, which has accompanying it a feeling of freedom, a feeling of choice, a feeling of achievement. And those, are, I think, are terribly important. I have never been against freedom and dignity. I'm all for feeling freer than ever, and I'm all for being more achieving than ever, having a greater sense of accomplishment. But you get that not by working on the individual are working even to contrive the feelings, but building a world in which people work for positive reasons rather than negative and work successfully and therefore achieve positively reinforcing consequences. This concludes our discussion with Professor B.F. Skinner. You have been listening to one in a series of Psychology Today cassettes on subjects in the behavioral and social sciences.